Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to have you all here. Um, I'm sure others will be coming in and joining us uh, midway, but so far, let's just start the exciting program. Um, so my name is Fiona Nzingo. I am the Global Forum for Media Development's uh, measure, uh, Membership and Engagement Manager. So before I introduce our excellent panelists today, let me just quickly share uh, briefly about the GFMD for those who may not be knowing. So the GFMD is a dynamic network that brings together media organizations, journalists, advocates, and experts worldwide who are sharing a common goal to champion the growth and sustainability of the media sector. In, in this time where um, information knows no boundaries, GFMD stands as a beacon for collaboration, fostering dialogue and knowledge exchange on a global scale. So we aim to address the multifaceted challenges the media industry faces today through a number of initiatives. We serve as a platform for critical conversations on media freedom, press ethics, and the evolving role of, of journalism in this society. We also empower media professionals with resources, support, and connections needed to thrive in this ever-changing uh, media landscape. So by joining forces with GFMD, for those who haven't already, um, we give an opportunity for individuals and organizations to gain access to an extensive network of like-minded advocates and benefit from a wealth of resources, including programs, research opportunities, capacity building initiatives, which are aimed to elevate the standard of journalism worldwide. Um, I invite each and every one of you, both members and non-members, to continue exploring the valuable contributions of GFMD and we hope to continue amplifying our, our impact to continue fostering collaboration and driving a positive change in the media landscape. So that is my short pitch of GFMD. Um, on to our panelists of today. Um, you may see we have Preeti Nalu and Kevin Grant. I, I would like to, to welcome them um, to this webinar for Report for the World, a snapshot of media partnerships in 20 countries. So before I introduce them, I'm, I'm thrilled to see such a diverse audience here from different corners of the world. And I'm, I'm excited that we, we have a chance to engage together. Um, so we are privileged to delve deeper into Report for the World's partnership with local newsrooms worldwide. Over this next hour or so, we have the privilege of hearing from Report for the World's Chief Development Officer, Kevin Grant, and the Executive Director, Preeti Nalu, who will share more about the initiative and a snapshot of the media partnerships with newsrooms in 20 countries. So beyond the presentation and beyond their sharing, I encourage you to actively participate in the discussion Feel free to ask any questions and share your insights. Um, your engagement is, is what will make this webinar a dynamic learning experience. So without further ado, um, I welcome Report for the World's Executive Director, Preeti Nalu, to take the floor. Thank you so much, Fiona, and our colleagues at uh, GFMD for inviting us to this panel. It's an exciting time for us to be sharing uh, where we are today at Report for the World and some of our upcoming plans. Um, but I think it would uh, serve as well to widen the lens a bit and set the premise um, for how Report for the World came about. Um, Kevin Grant really is the chief architect of uh, this program and came up with the infrastructure, um, a really unique process based on which we've been able to expand. So Kevin, maybe you could sort of provide us a bit of the lay of the land. How did Report for America, um, Report for the World come about and uh, what you've learned from our sister program, Report for America, and how we're implementing that towards our global program? Thank you so much, Preeti. And indeed, you know, just so everyone knows, Preeti is the true leader here. I She is far too kind to call me the architect. Um, but the Ground Truth Project is an organization that does try to innovate and to help support independent media worldwide. 
uh, and we have been doing that since 2014. Um, I will say that we had a turning point as an organization in, you know, right about, um, you know, right about 2016, um, when we realized that our U.S. based organization was going through some major uh, challenges in our own democracy. Um, for several years, we had been supporting independent journalism, primarily through international uh, fellowships, international reporting fellowships. Um, but in early 2017, uh, we launched a brand new service program that we called Report for America, indeed Report for the World's uh, sister program, uh, with the aim of strengthening communities all across the United States by supporting full-time local journalism positions in partnership with our, our newsroom partners. Um, that went incredibly well uh, in the sense that we were able to grow from three reporters in the Appalachia region in 2017 um, to 325 reporters in all 50 states, plus Guam, Puerto Rico, and Washington, DC within about four years. And I think uh, one of the key reasons why this model, which Report for the World also employs, has been so successful is because we do share the salary costs with our partner newsrooms and we collaborate with our partners to help raise even more money um, while we also provide different types of support when it comes to um, hiring talented reporters, uh, when it comes to training, uh, a certain amount of mentorship um, and editorial collaboration. So as our sort of home organization uh, is named, the Ground Truth Project, um, we truly believe that it's all about being there, that there is no substitute for on the ground, in-person, community-based reporting. Um, while of course we all know that, you know, sometimes a phone call will do or a Zoom call will do or uh, social media will do, um, you know, we've always tried to support those kinds of positions where there's a good amount of face-to-face -face interaction, learning from, you know, what's going on in communities and also quite frequently um, having a watchdog uh, effect um, on the most powerful. Um, just one more thing to say um, is that, you know, the types of beats that both Report for America and now Report for the World support um, tend to um, be along a certain sort of set. And what I mean to say is, um, you know, climate environment is a very popular beat in our program, um, education, uh, health, um, uh, fact checking, and like I said, sort of watchdog and investigative reporting. That's not the limit on what we support, but those tend to be some of our more popular beats. Um, and, you know, every year, and actually now we're going to start to move to twice a year, we are offering these uh, open calls to newsrooms um, all over the world to apply for our program. Um, and then we begin to partner with these, these organizations. So Preeti, I'll pa pass back to you so I don't risk going on too long, um, but hopefully that helps to set the stage. Absolutely. Actually, I wanted you to elaborate a bit on our process because it's quite unique in terms of how we provide the salary support and uh, over a three-year cycle, how newsrooms, for example, those attending this web webinar can apply. Absolutely. Um, so we try to make it as simple as possible. Um, you know, uh, when we do uh, put out the call for applications from newsrooms, we ask for um, basically newsrooms to propose very specific beats. And then we ask a few additional questions about how those beats, how those positions uh, might have most impact in uh, the newsrooms community and the newsrooms country. Um, when we select our newsrooms, we commit um, right away um, to pay for uh, half of the salary cost of each position. And we enter into each partnership with the goal, with the hope that this will actually be a three year partnership. Um, so over the first two years, uh, we are 50 50 on the salary with the partner newsroom. And then our part goes down to one third in the third year. So there's a bit of a transition there. Um, we're very proud that, you know, uh, all of our initial newsrooms, a couple of which you will hear from today, um, have, you know, stayed with us in the program. Um, so, you know, we're actually now entering uh, the third year of our partnership with uh, both Scroll um, and the cable um, and continuing also to work with Premium Times and other fantastic newsrooms uh, around the world. So um, we're happy to answer more detailed questions, but it's pretty easy to think about it as just a matching formula in which we share the cost of the creation of the new reporting position. 
Thank you for that, Kevin. And as you said, our process of support is always full-time salary positions over a three-year cycle. We're paying for half of the sa salary and the newsroom uh, newsrooms pay for the other half. So it's a true partnership. And in tandem, we foster the growth of the reporters in their own career trajectories. And we work with the newsrooms to find sustainability around these critical beats. So now with 45 reporters at 32 fantastic independent newsrooms in 20 countries, we've started to look at how are we best placed to nurture the development of our core members while enabling them to connect across borders to reach uh, diverse audiences at different levels. And simultaneously, we're also starting to work with our newsroom partners to create sustainability. So we're looking more closely at um, audience engagement, story impact, diverse revenue models around these critical beats that we're supporting. To achieve this, we have a very concrete two-track program. So the first track supports the sustainability, revenue, diversification efforts of the newsrooms. And uh, the second track supports the uh, professional development of the journalists um, and, and sometimes editors and fosters cross-border collaborations among our newsrooms in the global south, but also among our newsroom partners and larger specialized media. And so these two processes take place in parallel because we feel that it is a combination of these efforts that would lead to a true uh, transformation of the media landscape from a small number of large media that are dominating the news cycles in entire countries sometimes to a, to a larger number of small specialized media that together can paint a fuller picture of what is going on and can hopefully sometimes work with these large media to reach more audiences. So I'd really like to make this session interactive. So I thought to see how that looks, what that looks like in practice, I'd like to invite one of our, our core members, um, that is how we refer to our reporters, Chamaka Okafo, who's uh, reporting for the Premium Times. And she's done some remarkable work in her respective critical beat. Um, so Chamaka will uh, take a second to give you the voice there. Okay, perfect. Um, here you are. I wanted to know how did focusing on your particular critical beat, if you can tell us a bit more about what you cover, um, how did that help you in your own career trajectory? How did it give you the consistency uh, <laughs> as a journalist to be able to do deeper reporting? Hi, Bri. Um, It's afternoon here. So good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So my name is Chemakal Kafo. I'm Nigerian and I live in Nigeria as well. I work for Premium Times, one of Nigeria's leading investigative accountability news platform. Just to quickly say that I saw um, a poll asking where I'm speaking from and there's no Africa there. I just saw North Africa and MENA. So there should be West Africa and South Africa and other parts of Africa or maybe just Africa works better. Um. So... <clears throat> I am a senior reporter on the Diaspora and International Desk. That's the name of my desk. <clears throat> so I like to call it everything foreign. Yeah, but Diaspora and International. So on the desk, I report and follow the stories of Nigerians living in the Diaspora, as well as <clears throat> all, I'm so sorry, <clears throat> as well as every international news or every news coming out of um, anywhere in the world which our uh, audience may find relevant. And I must say that in the last um, two years, yeah, two years already, well, in the last two years, I started on the roll. Um, a lot of people now read news out that is coming from outside Nigeria and people are starting to pay more attention to what's happening around the world aside what's happening in Nigeria. Uh, so for instance, in the last years, I've been able to interview Nigerian Americans, Nigerian Canadians, you know, and people are interested in their stories. Oh, you've left Nigeria and you're outside of Nigeria doing well. What's your life like? These are the kind of things people are interested in, you know. So, of course, we're human beings and we're like, we're very much interested in stories of other humans like us. I like to say we generally just like gossip. So whatever tickles our fancy, you know. Not that it's gossip, of course. So over the years, um, I've become an authority 
on diaspora issues authority in courts right because i'm not the government i'm just a journalist international issues and everything within that terrain <clears throat> of course i'm consistently challenged to improve and build on what i know because then reporting on the international beats means you need to understand everything from climate change so i heard kevin talk about climate change and <laughs> interestingly i have also been recruited or What's the word now? Recruited is nice because that means you, you consented, right? But somehow, with or without my consent, I'm also part of the climate change desk in my newsroom because, of course, I've had to learn about it and understand those issues. Financing, global financing, World Bank, IMF, so just everything international, really. So it's been a challenge in the last two years, a challenge I really enjoy because then I've had to um, push myself more read more, understand issues. And I'm impressed that I understand finances. I usually run away from numbers, but look at me now. Dealing with the numbers gradually. Yeah. Fantastic. So, I, I just, I wanted to ask you another quick follow-up question, um, which is you, you mentioned diaspora audiences and you mentioned, you know, for example, Nigerians in the uh, Nigerian Americans. So a lot of what you cover has a natural cross-border element. Where do you feel a uh, global service program program like ours can provide you with more of those, you know, facilitate more of those connections so that you can work with other reporters or you can cover the story better? How can we improve? Yeah, so I like to start by saying, you know, so there's this very cliche saying in Nigeria or maybe around the global south, but I'm happy to let you guys in on the big secret. So. Anywhere in the world you go to and you don't find Nigerians, you probably have left the Earth. Maybe you're in Pluto, Mars, or Jupiter, somewhere, not the Earth, because Nigerians are everywhere. So this is me saying that, you know, a program like Report for the World that puts me in contact with other people in other parts of the world where definitely Nigerians reside is a big resource. Maybe a little too underestimated for the kind of potential or, or what it brings to the table. But Report for the World is one platform where if I want to report on things happening in the Congo, for example, or even in Ukraine, because I know there are core members, there are core members from Ukraine, from Brazil, you know, so this place is Nigerians reside, Nigerians visit, you know, it's easy for me, right? Then I do not have to travel all the way to Brazil or Ukraine, except it becomes inevitable. But <clears throat> this network affords me the opportunity to report across border, just sitting in front of my computer like I'm doing now, speaking to you from whatever part of the world you're sitting in. Uh, so yeah, um, of course it's great, but for everything that is great, it can be better. So when you ask the question, uh, what can we do? I can only say just keep doing what you're doing and I'm sure along the line you find things to do or more initiatives to make it better but so far so good I think it's great. Thank you for those very generous words Shamaka um, and we have a lot more we could be accomplishing and that's exactly what we're looking at and what you just mentioned definitely has a very important element of um, uh, diversity and representation. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about how we look at diversity of, and representation vis-a-vis um, -vis the um, background of the journalists who are covering the stories that were, or the beats that we're reporting, as this impacts the type of stories that are covered, the people that are interviewed for them, and the viewpoints that are explored, right? So at the programmatic le level, we're also looking at diversity through the lens of uh, the diversity of the beats themselves. As Kevin mentioned earlier, we do have our popular beats, uh, climate, um, environment, corruption, gender, economy, etc. But we are also looking at the intersectional aspects. Uh, what does it look like when you have a reporter that is covering um, caste, another that is covering civil liberties, another that is uh, covering gender in one newsroom, that would be our partner News Minute in India, that creates a much richer intersectional beat coverage. And we're seeing that in the reporting that they're producing. Another lens that we put on is geographic diversity. So where are these newsrooms across the world? So our main regions of operation are Central and Latin America, West, East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Eastern Europe uh, and Middle East and North Africa and different parts of Asia. We're in the South, Southeast and Central Asia at the moment. Uh, but within the countries, where are these uh, newsrooms located? So another type of geographic diversity, are they rural, are they urban, uh, are they national, regional or hyperlocal? Uh, what types of communities are they covering? So these are the different types of uh, diversity requirements we look at from our ap applications so that the newsrooms that we recruit are also complementary in nature and can work effectively together and have more of a collaborative spirit. Another type of uh, um, another way by which we're ensuring uh, that our expansion maintains uh, diversity is through our uh, regional hub strategy. So we decentralize our overall decision uh, making mechanisms because uh, we work closely with regional and country specific organizations uh, from investigative networks to academic institutions that can help us reach more diverse uh, newsrooms and journalists and that can help us shape professional development and sustainability to meet context specific needs. So again, to audiences watching today, we're always on the lookout for specialized regional and local media specialists and organizations that can be our um, allies, our representatives, our collaborators in these different regions. And so how can all of this in turn be best achieved? Our, it's really through our own team diversity at Report for the World. We've started to expand our staff to include um, regionally and locally based program managers uh, to add to our existing program managers from uh, Lebanon, Colombia, uh, Brazil, Asia, etc. And so we'll continue to recruit with those contexts in mind um, because they have the language and the nuance of these regions and they're able to bring us more diverse newsrooms. Uh, but I'd like to take a moment because Kevin really has been again at the helm of uh, diversity and inclusion within our own program. Kevin, could you provide a little bit of insights uh, on that, how do we ensure there's diversity within our own organization and how does that reflect on our program? Sure, thank you, Preeti. Um, yes, the Ground Truth Project has uh, a long-term commitment to you know what we call DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, and we really try to support each aspect of the strategy through our actual work and sort of our day-to-day -day lived experience, not just words that we say. Um, you know, there are different ways that we measure that, and Preeti just, as you heard, carefully outlined the way we think about this geographically. Um, but of course, we're also thinking along, you know, different sort of what can be called fault lines by the Maynard Institute, um, gender, uh, race and ethnicity, um, class, and so many more, uh, generation, um, so many different ways in which uh, people can be marginalized, ways in which the privilege shows up or does not. Um, and, you know, we're proud that in our programs, um, we are supporting a broad range of representation in the reporting core, um, along with the leadership, as Preeti mentioned. Um, just a couple of statistics for you. Um, across both of our programs, and that's well over 600 reporters, approaching 700 uh, since the launch of Report for America, uh, more than 70% of our core members uh, have been women or identify as women, um, and more than 50% identify as people of color. Um, so, you know, part of this strategy also is acknowledging, you know, one's own privilege, you know, myself acknowledging white male uh, based in the United States, um, also acknowledging that there is no part of the world that has a monopoly on truth or is where um, best practices will exclusively come from. We just know that's not true. GFMD knows that's not true. And this is why we together as a team um, have built you know, two sister programs um, where good ideas can come from anywhere, where mutual respect is paramount, um, and where we just love to work collaboratively to facilitate a sense of belonging. So Preeti, I hope that helps a little bit and I pass back to you. Absolutely. And we started at home for a reason, right, to to with Report for America. And so that also says a lot about the uh, the very foundational values by which we operate. Um, and uh, just to just, just to sort of echo what you said, uh, we're all at some level of the ladder of privilege. And so I'm acutely aware that there's 
you know, quite a few South Asian uh, professionals in the media development field and sometimes overrepresented in parts of Africa. And so taking that into account as well as we expand um, and sort of that awareness is super important in this period. Um, so I actually wanted to continue with another key uh, aspect of our program, which is sustainability and media innovation. And we've spoken to our peers at GFMD a bit about this, and we'd love to continue engaging new conversations on what this means. But from the Report for the World uh, lens, what we see is that uh, a lot of our newsroom partners that are successful with sustainability have these hybrid revenue models. So a combination of membership, reader contributions, um, campaign drives, newsletter subscriptions, advertising, digital and in-person events, et cetera. And of course, there are public and private grants that form a large percentage of the revenue or the sustainability. So over the past years, we've seen that audience-driven models have been on the rise. And so what we're doing in this period is starting to employ our foundational process of supporting specific critical beats uh, as a way of reaching new audiences, creating um, uh, more engagement and helping, that tran helping transform that into revenue. So our goal uh, is to help generate sort of this engagement impact revenue cycle systematically and at scale in, among our newsroom partners. And so we're starting to convene these peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, among our newsrooms that are working on similar types of uh, revenue diversification, whether it's membership models or whether it is selling certain products or um, or uh, doing campaigns around their reporting. Or at, um, So we're looking at um, regional and global organizations again uh, that house innovation experts, for example, the International Press Institute that has been our thought partner in this process. And we're working with them to look at how we can capture some of the learnings from these uh, uh, audience engagement revenue models and to be able to integrate these learnings into the editorial processes of our newsroom partners. Because a lot of times our newsroom partners do not have dedicated full-time media innovation experts, but if we can systemize these learnings and if we can form a truly um, sort of, um, uh, I guess, collaborative information exchange hub, then we'll be able to come up with templates that are scalable and provide new opportunities for our local media partners to be able to experiment. And so again, what does that look like in practice? I think uh, one of our original um, newsroom partners is best equipped to answer this. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Supriya Sharma, who's uh, executive director, or oh, sorry, executive editor at The Scroll in India to share a few of her thoughts. Um, Supriya, have have we been able to unmute you? Yes, perfect. Um, Supriya, was, we've had a few of these conversations um, around uh, these critical beats. Maybe we can actually start with, what was some of your thinking when you applied for the specific critical beats? Um, and how has this sort of changed how these roles are viewed within your larger editorial mission at this role? Thanks so much, Preeti. Greetings to everyone from Delhi, India. Um, we are really very grateful to Report for the World for supporting these three roles, which are now an integral part of our newsroom. These are uh, beats that we've always been invested in. Uh, however, as a small independent newsroom, uh, you know, it's always been challenging for us to juggle the various responsibilities that we have in India. Um, you know, at, at this point, when our democracy is facing various challenges, for a while our attention was sort of riveted to covering politics, covering, uh, you know, social polarization. Um, and, and that meant that at some point we felt we were neglecting beats that were part of our core mission. And Report for the World support helped us uh, create roles which uh, we think uh, are are on you know the reporters are covering vital beats, but also what's very important to us is that they write in-depth investigative stories that have actually allowed us to build a whole new section on our site called Common Ground. It's a section we are very proud of because 
It's helped us step away from the noise of the daily news cycle and focus on the stories that matter. And to do that through traditional shoe leather journalism, where reporters spend a lot of time on the ground understanding an issue by speaking to the people, the communities that are affected by it, and not just to experts. Uh, one of uh, the reporters writes on land, environment, climate change, arguably the most significant beat of our times. Another reporter covers health and education, the essential building blocks for social development. And the third reporter focuses on labor and gender with a particular focus on marginalized communities. Preeti, you mentioned caste. In India, that's, that's sort of a major determinant of uh, uh, what a person's life is going to be like. And, and not only are we now being able to write more stories on, on caste and its impact, uh, but we're also quite happy that uh, through support from Report for the World, we've also been able to you know, introduce more diversity in, in, in sort of our reporting teams. And uh, you know, that kind of reflects in the kind of stories that we have published um, um, uh, under Common Ground, this section that I was talking about. Uh, just this week, our Common Ground story is about how Dalit women presidents, Dalits are basically communities that are at the bottom of the caste ladder. Uh, and uh, my colleague Johanna uh, has reported on how Dalit women presidents in villages, these are elected uh, heads of villages, uh, these women have won the election, they've come to uh, hold an important office in the village, and yet often they aren't allowed to sit on a chair. Um, because those who consider themselves higher up the caste hierarchy think that it's kind of beneath them to have a conversation with the village president uh, uh, who is a Dalit woman and who's sort of occupying a high chair. So, you know, these are stories that... Uh, that, uh, that, that go unreported in the news cycle. And, and now that we have uh, dedicated reporters who can spend time on these stories, we're able to surface them better. We're um, able to open up whole new worlds for our readers, many of whom have actually also gone on to sign up as members. So not only have these three reporters produced great, award-winning, insightful journalism, they've also actually proved to be fairly integral to our efforts to building a sustainable newsroom, a newsroom that's always been guided by the motto uh, that we're going to cover the stories that are untold. The, the news, basically our foundational uh, logo was, we'll cover the news that matters and the things that make life worth living. And these three reporters have gone a long way in helping us live up to that. And that's really music to our ears and something you just touched upon, Supriya, which is, you know, a section or a beat um, or, or a section like uh, Common Ground, it can also attract membership because people feel that they're getting very specialized information and they're part of also somehow, you know, that editorial mission. Uh, so you create more engaged audiences. So I know that we've been talking more about this off late because as you sort of graduate from this three year cycle, longer term sustainability around these roles becomes important. And so maybe if you could share a few of your thoughts, listening to us talk about our media innovation ideas, what is it, what does help look like for you and how can other engaging with other newsrooms possibly help? Preeti, one thing that I feel often gets overlooked in conversations about making good journalism viable is that reporters don't work in isolation. They need a lot of support, whether it's from senior editors who help shape their ideas or uh, copy editors who help craft the writing, video editors who can now translate that work into new formats. Then there are audience editors. I mean, now extremely crucial to getting the stories out there. Um, and I sometimes wonder if it would be possible for programs like Report for the World to you know, help newsrooms like ours strengthen this architecture, which is sort of invisible. It doesn't really show up quite in the same way as you know, you'd see reporter bylines, but the five other people who've sort of gone into making that story possible, um, who are actually the spine of a newsroom and arguably a journalist in senior editorial roles actually enable a whole newsroom to make a leap 
in a new direction. They're the ones who lead innovation. They're the ones who sort of help build partnerships. Uh, as you mentioned, like, again, you know, partnering and collaborating with, with other newsrooms, uh, that peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, so, yeah, I do wonder if, um, you know, the next step could involve editors, um, you know, and sort of and, and that's an in some ways the leaders of a newsroom. Absolutely. And that's an excellent uh, suggestion and exactly along the lines of what we're thinking about is really the people who are in the newsroom who have sort of the larger picture. Thank you for those thoughts, Supriya. Absolutely duly noted. And we really hope that uh, the upcoming efforts engage the leadership in newsrooms just as much. And so part of what you mentioned as well was the sort of the professional development or the, the architecture that needs to be built around each reporter so they may excel. So that, that sort of ties in with our professional development efforts, that's track two. And um, so to complement the sustainability uh, track, we're also ensuring that our reporters themselves are, uh, mm -hmm. would like to ensure that our reporters themselves are able to progress in their careers and that they're able to really stay in the profession and in their countries and communities where they've chosen to work. And so to, to be able to facilitate that growth, we feel that tying the professional development efforts to the collaborative journalism opportunities, as you mentioned, Supriya, is super important. And what I mean by that is we're now starting to plan trainings with concrete outputs in mind. So as an example, we would bring in a global specialized media that covers a theme like climate change or corruption, or is uh, particularly um, uh, focused on investigating money trails or using open source investigative methods, we bring in a partner like that or a trainer like that so that journalists from these specialized media hold a series of trainings. And these will always be based on the expressed interest of our core members and editors and the deeper reporting ideas that they bring to the table. So following these trainings, we would then uh, hold pitch clinics where our editorial team comes in and where these media trainers come, come in and the uh, member journalists may pitch their story ideas with local global connections. We help them refine their angles and then we introduce these story pitches to uh, other media or the media trainers that have worked with us are able to co-publish them. So what we're trying to do is sort of connect professional development to skill building as well as concrete outputs in the form of stories that reach larger audiences. And working with me very closely on this process is our managing editor, Wilson Levano, who's been with the project for quite a few years now when um, they were doing fellowships, as uh, Kevin Grant mentioned. Um, and so, Wilson, I actually wanted to sort of further contextualize what, what this means in, in, in practice. Uh, we have a very strong uh, cohort in Latin America. We are present in Chile, Peru, Brazil, Nicaragua, El Salvador, um, and Brazil. And so that's quite a few uh, different country contexts, but also different critical beats that we're supporting in these countries. What are you seeing in terms of this diversity? Um, what are, how, is this affecting the quality of cross-border ideas? Maybe some of your reflections because you hold these monthly regional meetups. And so there must be a lot of different ideas coming at you. Thank you, Preeti. Uh, yes, I see it as an expression of uh, everything that you've been uh, discussing so far. Uh, the gatherings that we have with the Latin American core members uh, which also in, include Brazil, uh, although we has uh, hold uh, uh, separate uh, conversations with them because of language, um, have a very collaborative tone to them. Uh, whether it is also because of the uh, regional connections in the shared language, everybody that comes to these meetings, they come with a mindset of uh, sharing what they are working on and also looking to hear what the others are saying. 
Uh, and it's extended uh, recently uh, more because we heard from the same core members of saying, we love to have these conversations. We love to talk about what we're doing, thinking of how we can connect together. But also we want to hear about uh, our Brazilian colleagues. And uh, we're trying to facilitate that now to also have them connect. Uh, many of the things that happen also is that these beats that they explore start intersecting thanks to the the conversations that they have in the in these gatherings. Um, when they start talking about, for example, of uh, migration and the intersection with the uh, gender issues or with the intersection with the uh, environment, this uh, the reporters start. As a, generates a, a flow of ideas that it's very informal, that it's a, a also opens the door for everybody to participate. So in the last couple of uh, of gatherings, for example, we uh, have uh, seen some similarities from uh, the coverage that some of our core members have been doing in the Amazonian region and the topics that have to do with health and uh, indigenous communities with uh, the work that other core members are doing in uh, Mexico, in Peru, and uh, in Nicaragua, and uh, the, the border between Mexico and the United States. Some of these topics, the core, the core members themselves see the overlaps, and they already start thinking and connecting among themselves. Um, even without our involvement, uh, many times we uh, we know that two of our newsrooms uh, started uh, to talk about a collaboration and a project uh, that came out of a, of an in-person gathering that we had, but also of the conversations that they had later, which for us uh, is uh, it's our our, our objective. Uh, we don't necessarily have to be there to uh, shepherd every single project, but uh, in or, uh, just have them connect, just have them know that they can reach out to other people in their network uh, and, uh, and build together uh, stories. Thank you for that, Wilson. And I think you touched upon the heart of what our mission is, is that our newsroom partners and our core members reflexively reach out to each other where we're no, lo no longer needed other than as interlocutors who sort of amplify ideas, um, inspire new ideas. Um, and so this is also a reflection of um, the, ri the richness of the diversity in Latin America is also a reflection of your own background, being from Colombia, having covered Latin America, and with Leticia Duarte, our um, Latin America program manager, who's a fantastic Brazilian journalist. Also, our other regionally based uh, staff, Rania Itani, who's also another journalist based in Beirut, Lebanon, who's been working with our program. Um, and so I guess, again, this, this goes back to the whole diversity and representation uh, conversation and that reflecting at different levels. I know that we're running short on time, so I just wanted to wrap up the discussion part, allow at least 10 minutes for questions. We do have two calls coming up that we'd like to share with our members. Um, Kevin, uh, might you take a moment to um, announce our partnership with East West uh, Center and a specialized call for business focused journ journalists in Asia Pacific. Absolutely. So as Preeti said, um, next month, um, we will announce a partnership with the East West Center. So you all are getting a sneak preview. Um, this is the an opportunity that will be open uh, to newsrooms and reporters in the Pacific Island nations. So it is a specialized call, as Preeti said, a region specific opportunity um, to focus on sort of financial accountability um, among leadership on these islands. Um, we are excited about this partnership because the East West Center brings so much local expertise. Um, and we are the type of organization that always wants to welcome and defer to um, local expertise. So together, we think we're a, a strong uh, partnership. And also this sets a precedent, we hope, uh, for future specialized regional calls 
um, opportunities that will likely also be around specific beats. So that is one thing that's coming right up. Um, and then our standard sort of global open call for um, newsrooms to apply um, will happen early next year. Um, we'll certainly be sharing that information um, with you all, um, hopefully through GFMD. Um, and uh, that will be, um, as I say, uh, a chance for newsrooms to propose really just about any type of beat under the sun. Um, and then if selected, uh, we work closely to help the newsroom um, actually hire uh, those reporters um, with the salary subsidy that we previously talked about. I might just quickly underscore before passing back to Preeti that all of the core members in Report for the World, all of the reporters, they are full-time employees of our partner newsrooms, right? So our partners have full editorial independence from us. Uh, we have simply asked the beat to be broadly defined and some goals for impact to be broadly defined um, in the beginning of the process. But from there, um, we, we never uh, offer any sort of feedback, any pressure, anything like that on the day-to-day -day storytelling, on the actual reporting, on the editing. So, uh, and that we insist that with our partners as well. Um, in this case, the East West Center would not have any direct influence uh, over the day-to-day -day work of our partners. So just wanted to make that point um, so that was clear. Thank you for reiterating that, Kevin, um, because yes, as, as you said, any of the processes we've talked about today, the editorial, the professional development and other elements are very much also informed by the needs and the expressed desires of our newsroom partners and the core members. Um, the main responsibility of the reporters that uh, are selected is towards their newsrooms uh, and the editorial, um, editorial goals of their teams. Um, with that, I'd love to open up the room for questions. There might have been a series. I was very busy sort of orchestrating this tight uh, session, so I have not been able to see any of the queries. Fiona, could you help me out with those, please? Yes. Um, so for starters, we have Benedict question. Um, in, but Kevin has already answered, and if you would want to share your thoughts on it, Preeti, you're more than welcome. Um, he mentions that uh, there are mission-led global um, African digital newsroom working with reporters are across the continent and its diaspora, while also proving journalists, providing journalists with resources, skills, and experiences they need to tell stories from their community. And they're currently based in Kinshasa and London. And they wanted to know if they're eligible to become partners. Uh, our process is quite bespoke in terms of uh, figuring out how these beats and the newsrooms fit into our uh, application runs. So I think um, I, I would be happy to talk through our process and look at what your needs are. So let me copy paste my email address. Please feel free to write to us directly. And it looks and, like, uh, sorry, Fiona. Uh, I just wanted to mention um, Harun Bal Baloch's comment as well, Preeti. I don't know if you've had the chance to read it and if you would like to react. Kevin, would you like to respond? So sure, I mean, this is a complex question. I think um, maybe there are two things I could contribute as part of a response. Um, one is as a program um, report for the world, does tend to differ um, to the norms, the standards, the practices of our partner newsrooms. Um, you know, in the case though, I think that's being raised here uh, in Pakistan, um, women's women facing discrimination uh, and not really being allowed to uh, cover, you know, core beats like politics, legislation, foreign affairs, uh, conflicts, et cetera. Um, I think what I would say is that if um, a partner newsroom was seeking to work with Report for the World anywhere in the world, um, and we uh, learned that there was discrimination in the hiring practices of that uh, newsroom, uh, that would probably make them uh, an unlikely partner for us. I would just say that. Um, so, you know, we, with all of our partners, we want to ensure that there is uh, sort of the full range of opportunity uh, for reporters of any background, any gender, any race, any ethnicity, any caste. 
Um, so I, I think that's that's I will try I will go not I will not go beyond my expertise here and just uh, offer those thoughts. Absolutely. And to, to reiterate what you've said, Kevin, we spent a fair bit of time sort of vetting and looking at the history of uh, uh, the newsroom applicants and also liaising with our partners, whether it's GFMD or others who would know a bit more about these organizations. So that is a process we take very seriously, especially with diversity and representation. And just to provide an example of progressive media uh, in, on the subcontinent, uh, we our partner Tribal News Network proposed with several beats. We ended up supporting the migration beat because of the recurring floods and the situation it's posing in the country. But their other beat, uh, which we'd love to extend support to in the future, was a gender beat with a woman reporter heading it, and even uh, possibly from a, a, a displaced community from an Afghan uh, background. So we are painstaking in our sort of sort of attention to those details. Perfect. Well, I had my own question, but because I'm the host, I'm not able to ask it there in the Q&A. So I'll just go ahead and ask, um, have there been any challenges faced during the implementation of this initiative? Um, it being a global initiative, I can imagine how challenging it must be. And, and I'm curious to know, if there's anything that you experienced in the first cohort that in, that you're hoping to not experience in the coming cohort. Um, Preeti, would you like me to start answering that or would you like to answer? That'd be great, thank you. Oh, sure. Um, I, I would say we have been very, very fortunate to have incredibly uh, just talented, innovative, ethical newsroom partners. Um, and incredibly, you know, ethical, talented, innovative core members. Um, so thankfully, and, you know, I'm knocking on wood here, um, you know, we have a strong sort of infrastructure in terms of our partnerships and the talented people that we are so lucky to, to work with. Um, I think for me, the biggest um, sort of downside or weakness of the program so far, or maybe just the thing that I wish we had been able to do more quickly as an organization is just to more completely build out our regional hubs. Um, as Preeti shared, it's a priority for us. Um, and we are very proud of the team that we have begun to assemble. Um, but we know that we would really like to do more hiring, um, you know, certainly in Africa, certainly in Asia, and really worldwide. Mostly it's a resource constraint. Um, so, um, you know, one of our top priorities is not only sort of continuing to build out the strategy for the regional hubs and all the things that those can offer, um, but making sure that we have the, the resources to uh, to support those. And we do believe that the kinds of regional partnerships like East West Center and some of the resources that they bring to the table um, do help us gradually build that out. So I think I would point to that as something that it's been the, the growing pains. And so we're learning from that for sure. And just to add to that, I think uh, when it comes to sort of um, it being a resource issue, we'd love to support more newsrooms, uh, simply that. I mean, we received about 90 something or over 100 applications. And I would say we had to say no to at least, you know, 30 to 35 newsrooms that were perfectly, you know, suitable, but we just didn't have uh, the space, the resources, financial resources to support all of them. So really, this is also where we're seeking allies where that could kind of build these resources, especially from a regional point of view. And this would also strengthen our regional hub strategy. So as Kevin said, we're doing this call with East West Center with a Pacific Island focus. We'd love to do the same for the Middle East and North Africa, for West Africa or East Africa or Southern Africa and continue building that way. Uh, it's just, yes, keeping keeping sort of that pace, that momentum can be challenging. We're a small but nimble team, quickly growing in size. And um, yeah, with that comes some growing pains, but we rely a lot on our sort of allied partners like GFMD to be able to learn, how can we do this better next time? Perfect. And I see more. Uh, one more question from Dagmar. Uh, safety threats working as a journalist is 
uh, every day more challenging question when supporting a reporter on the newsroom of an authoritarian country. Do you have specific requirements to the media outlets or directors in terms of minimal security measures? Absolutely. That's one of the key questions in the newsroom application is what are the security protocols in place? For example, we had to go back and forth a few times. Again, this is where our bespoke, bespoke process makes sure we don't miss any of the details. Uh, we had a criminal justice focus reporter at the Foundation for Investigative Journalism in Nigeria. So, so we had to do a little bit of a back and forth to see what are the protocols in place when they're covering protests, given that they can get violent easily. Uh, another example is um, media in exile. We're only able to support reporters in this period who are outside of the regions of threats. Um, so for example, our Nicaraguan partner, Divergentes, they are uh, in Costa Rica, a fairly uh, stable place where they're able to function. Uh, we'd also like to start paying closer attention to psychosocial aspects of uh, uh, security and also online harassment and other forms of threats. There are many organizations, or at least a few organizations that do that really well. Uh, and we'd love to partner with them to see how we could provide that kind of contextual specific help. We keep refining our own process, but the, the protocols that are in place in these newsrooms are super important for us in determining if they're a suitable partner. Thank you, Preeti. Um, in light of time, I think we will take Omotayo's question as the last question. If you don't mind, um, uh, Umatayo wants to know if the program covers government-owned news mediums. So we uh, focus specifically on independent news media. So independent, of course, is subject to some level of an interpretation, but we do not do legacy media, which is how we look at state-funded media outlets, um, at least a report for the world. We're looking mostly at digital native uh, outlets that are independently funded. Um, Kevin, any thoughts to that? Because of, again, we've gone back and forth with some applicants to determine how independent they are. Yeah, I would say our, our approach is uh, a conversation never hurts, right? So we are certainly always happy to have, um, you know, a conversation to learn more about the news organization and its goals. Um, did share uh, Preeti and my um, email addresses here, and uh, we, we welcome, um, you know, all conversations because, as was already said, while we have a very clear focus on sort of independent, you know, digital native organizations, um, everything evolves. So um, we, we would be happy to talk. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Preeti. Um, thank you all for, for taking the time to, to meet with us and engage with us during this webinar. Um, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you uh, for your attendance, uh, to Chamaka, Supriya, and Wilson for your participation, and most importantly to Preeti and Kevin for the enlightening conversation. And I hope, as, as I have, I hope you found today's discussion both enlightening and inspiring. So I would say the end of this webinar is not the end of our engagement. We'll make sure to stay connected via email and we'll share Kevin and Preeti's uh, emails as well as other links uh, shared today via email in a follow-up email after the event. And uh, I would say that's about it from my side. Uh, once again, thank you for being part of today's webinar and we hope to stay in touch. Thank you.